Hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us for our webinar today. My name is Lucy and I'm the Marketing Executive here at Boltzenham. For those of you who aren't all too familiar with Boltzenham, we are a European trusted third party established in 1976 and we specialize in the protection and audit of digital assets. And today we're going to be discussing how you can add value to your business through embracing software escrow. Let's start by considering the following scenario. You're a software company that's been in business for a while now. You've been working on a deal for quite some time and you're just about to close it. But suddenly your prospective partner wants you to use a software escrow service as part of the deal. So you don't wanna lose out on closing the deal. So you need to find a way to keep the contract while also protecting your valuable resources. Or maybe you can relate stronger to scenario number two. You're a business that is outsourcing its software development process. However, the company that you've given the contract to isn't very experienced and you need to find a way to minimize your risk. You're faced with questions like, what if the business doesn't fulfill its commitments? And how can I ensure that I will get continued software support in case, for example, the developer goes bankrupt? Whichever scenario you fall under, for any business in the 21st century, understanding software escrow services is essential. A recent study by Gartner claims that software spending is expected to grow by more than 11% to almost 755 billion in 2023. And this is from an estimated 675 billion in 2022. And the truth remains that in the real world, software failures do happen. So your business needs to ensure that it will remain fully functional. And that's exactly where a software escrow service comes in. The purpose of our webinar today is just to explain the basics of a software escrow agreement and the benefits that it can bring to you. We will then address any questions that may arise in the, during the final 15 minutes of the session, which you can type into the chat window at the bottom of the screen. I would now like to welcome our speaker for this afternoon, Kristen Avon. Kristen is our senior legal officer here at Boltonham, who has previous experience working in international law and multiple high-tech industries. Hi, Kristen. Thank you for joining us today. Let's just start by discussing the basics. What is a software escrow agreement? Hi, Hi. Lucy, and thank you so much. Um, let's see, before I get into the fundamentals of what is an escrow contract, Lucy, would you help me with um, a little role playing exercise, kind of building off of one of the scenarios you just mentioned? Of course. Let's go. Okay. So let's say you are the CEO of I don't know, one of the largest rail systems in the UK, and you want to work with a technology provider to develop customized software that will revolutionize your, your timetable system. This technology will be strategic to the growth of your company. So given this context, its importance to your future, how would you make sure that this technology remains available and maintained over the long term? Well, first of all, I would want my provider to give me certain assurances in case they close up shop or they choose to no longer maintain the software. Um, and I'd want these assurances to obviously be enforceable. Of course you would. This software has strategic value to your company. And like anything of value, we want insurance on it. So in this scenario, putting in place a software ESCO agreement is the insurance that you need. Every day, companies around the world license custom software applications that are critical to the operation of their business. The development of these can cost in the millions of dollars. Because these applications are often critical, more and more companies like yourself, Lucy, in this example, are requiring software developers to store the source code of the software and documentation on how to use it in escrow. So in our example, a source code or, a source code or escrow arrangement would look like this. A supplier, so the software developer, deposits the source code and documentation with the trusted third party, the escrow agent, so that would be me for Boltonham, um, to be released to the beneficiary, you as the client, Lucy, upon the occurrence of a release event. So this could be, these events could be um, the software developer filing for bankruptcy, closing up shop, 
or failing certain obligations under the license. And following a release event, the insurance premise of the software ESCO is revealed. So in essence, you, Lucy, as the client beneficiary here, can obtain the source code to continue to use, and if agreed in the license, maintain the software without your supplier's involvement so that your business can continue to operate without interruption or impact, whether this means being able to maintain the software by fixing bugs or ensuring compatibility with system upgrades or just giving you some breathing room, some time until you can find a new supplier. Okay, so I see how an escrow is beneficial, especially for the client and user, but can an escrow agreement entertain other scenarios? Well, yes. So while the classic example is often between a software developer and client and user, and throughout, I'm probably going to use client, user, end user, beneficiary, all interchangeably, but they're all <laughs> the, the beneficiary here of the escrow. So it's often between the software developer and the client end user, and the objective of an escrow agreement can serve other situations as well, such as two partners who both hold title to an element and want reciprocal access, or a software developer and their investors who wish to secure their investment and ensure it is protected. An escrow arrangement, it does not even need to be limited to supplier and beneficiary. There can be four party escrow agreements. So let's say between the software developer, the software vendor, the end user, and the escrow agent. In essence, it is a method to secure the relation between the parties. So like I said before, it's a system of insurance and it can be both for purposes of the supplier, those who would be depositing the source code and for the beneficiary. Um, so the end users who will access in case of the supplier's failure. So on the side of the supplier, so the software developers, vendors, distributors, one of the advantages it has, it allows them to stand out from a crowded competitive field, okay? And essentially offer more value. It demonstrates that they've considered the deal from their client's end. And in effect, they are offering them a solution, a plan B, if plan A fails. So it offers them reassurance. And in effect, it's responding to their specific needs of their client. It is also a way for the supplier to frame the access conditions for the source code. So together with their client, they will decide under what conditions access will be granted. And by requiring the client to go through an independent third party, the supplier secures a level of neutrality and objectivity if the condition, conditions are met. Finally, as a bonus, depositing the source code is like taking out an extra security policy for the supplier. It's a backup. Essentially, a backup is always in place. Um, and in parallel, the supplier is securing the copyright in their source code. If ever an issue of authorship or unfair competition comes into play, this deposit serves as legal proof in court that the source code was owned at a specific date and time. On the other end, for the beneficiary client and user, um, as we saw in our example with you, Lucy, with the train company, users who rely on a third-party software for their operations are, in effect, putting in place a mechanism to secure their business and continue their operations without any costly interruptions if their supplier happens to fail. So it's a risk mitigation effort. By anticipating the failure of its supplier, they are able to secure the software in the long term. And finally, because often the beneficiary is the user of a software that has invested a certain amount of money in, it is a way to secure a long term investment if the supplier fails. So basically, what you're saying is that the escrow allows both parties to secure their business, one by enabling the deal and the other by allowing them to continue their business uninterrupted, even if their supplier fails. Exactly. Well, at least <laughs> at its core, both protective and enabling. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about the various escrow arrangements and some of their key differences. Get the slide. Yes. So there are three types of classic escrow contracts, tripartite, bipartite, and the access clause. 
The tripartite escrow contract, well, this is just a fancy way of saying a three-party agreement. And um, that means that it is signed by a supplier, a beneficiary, and an escrow agent. And this escrow agreement is in addition to the software licensing agreement or any other agreement between the supplier and end user. And this is an important point that I will return to in a bit. So this tripartite agreement is in effect dedicated solely to escrow. And its objective is to set forth the modalities of the deposit. So this means the it has to, um, it, it outlines the and content of the deposit, uh, the frequency of updates, payment terms, and also it outlines the release conditions, which are agreed upon between both parties and would allow the beneficiary to access the source code if one of these conditions, which were agreed to in advance, is met. The key difference between a tripartite and the other escrow arrangements is that an escrow agent is a party to the contract. The escrow agent's primary role is to ensure the contract. What does this mean? It means that the escrow agent will monitor the contract throughout its life and make sure the parties honor the terms they agreed to. So in our case, for example, Voltanum would alert the supplier and beneficiary if an update has not been made on the agreed date, or on the contrary, would inform the beneficiary if it has indeed been made. And much of this is carried out through Voltanum's centralized management dashboard, which helps the parties anticipate the requirements of the contract. So on this dashboard, suppliers and beneficiaries can log on and see when an update is due, if it was made, or make a payment. The next type of escrow arrangement is, that I'm going to talk about is the bipartite escrow agreement. And it serves the same function as the tripartite. The principal difference is that the escrow agent is not a party to the contract. It is uniquely a relation between the supplier and the beneficiary. And again, it is in addition to any other agreement between the supplier and the user, client, beneficiary. So one difference between this and the tripartite is that the supplier and beneficiary, the parties can define the law and jurisdiction they want to govern the contract. Whereas with the Voltanum tripartite, it is governed by the laws of Geneva, Switzerland, where we are based. So in general, the, tri the tripartite agreement is the most secure for beneficiaries because the escrow agreement has a more active role in monitoring and informing the beneficiary of a failure to deposit updates, a failure to pay, et cetera. And if there is a failure to pay by the supplier, for example, the, uh, the escrow agent will inform the beneficiary and they can always pay on their behalf and keep the contract in force. So are there any downsides to not including an escrow agent as a party in the agreement? Well, I would say that the primary disadvantage here is that it would not be an enforceable contract against the escrow agent because they are not a party to it. So it offers somewhat less security. Uh, this can create complications um, when the beneficiary wishes to access the source code, mainly because from a legal standpoint, since the escrow agent is not a party to the contract, they cannot be bound by it. So if the conditions of access were poorly defined, for example, the beneficiary cannot enforce the escrow agent to release it. This is also the case in the next type of escrow agreement I'm going to talk about, which is the access clause. This is a clause which is integrated into an existing contract between the beneficiary and supplier, such as an end user licensing agreement, a maintenance contract, or even as a clause in the general conditions of use. The access clause is frequently found in contracts that concern standard software that is not operational critical. And often it is made available to multiple clients. In other words, it is not specific to a particular client. At Voltanum, our access clause, for example, could be used in as many contracts as you have customers, so long as they are all relying on the same escrow source code. So the major difference between the escrow agreements that I just went over and the access clause is that the bipartite and tripartite agreements respond more to a particular client's specific needs. 
In um, our experience, these are more often used for technology, which is vital to a client's operations or for an investment, which is very consequential. So I just want to go back real quick and understand better the absence of the escrow agent in the access clause and the bipartite agreement and the fact that these contracts wouldn't be enforceable against the escrow agent. Does this happen? And is there anything that the parties can do to minimize this from occurring? Well, I am yet to see this happen, but it can't be pulled out. It remains a risk. This is why at Vulcan we suggest a certain minimum of content, content systematically be included so that there's no question of interpretation when or if it comes time that the clause is activated. In fact, our ACLIS access clause template requires this information to be provided. But in general, we recommend that you clearly define the name of the source code, the IDDN, which is a unique identification number that is provided upon a deposit in escrow, the name of the escrow agent, of course, so that we know the parties agree on who is the independent trusted third party um, holding the escrow. And also, very importantly, a very clear, very precise description of release cases. So somewhat often, we only learn of the clause after the signature or even at the moment the clause is activated. Thus, it is so important and it's critical that the release conditions be unambiguous. If there is any ambiguity or if the terms cannot be understood, Voltanum cannot provide access to the source code. And this is a security measure that's in place for all the parties. Thanks, Kristen. That's super clear. Um, now, can you talk to us a bit about what can be escrowed? In particular, I know we hear a lot of conversations around SaaS versus on-premise. Of course, sure, Lucy. It is a hot topic in the escrow world because today we are witnessing a rapid shift from traditional on-site models to the SaaS model. However, in principle and in practice, a SaaS escrow is not all that different from an on-premise escrow. And above all, the reasons for it um, that we need to guard against service disruption and provide continuity of business, these remain the same. So I'll just back up a little bit and add a little bit of background. So with a SaaS escrow, the focus is on software as a service applications. And so these involve, for example, a developer who creates an application which are delivered using hosting partners such as Amazon, Google, Microsoft Azure. So in short, a business, rather than installing infrastructure on their premises to deploy software, it subscribes to the delivery of software as a service via the cloud, for example. So one difference in using a SaaS model is that the production environment of the software, including its object code, is now controlled and managed by the software supplier. Also, data is often stored with a third party in the scenario. So in essence, the SAS, with the SaaS model, the user, client, beneficiary has even less control over data, so data storage, notably. Um, but so this makes the impact of developer failure, of supplier failure, even more immediate than compared with an on-premise application um, where data is often stored on location or backed up. So why is this failure? Why do I say that it's more immediate? Well, in addition to losing access to the software, including, as I said, the production environment and any data stored within it, the client beneficiary would most likely encounter challenges deploying this application since they have only ever experienced it as a user. So Kristen, what concretely does this mean when it comes to a supplier who wants to make a SaaS escrow? Yes. Okay. Well, it requires a supplier to deposit additional materials as compared with a traditional on-premise software escrow. While both require the deposit of the software source code, of course, businesses using the SaaS model need to have continued access to a fully functional SaaS tool, right? So this means their suppliers will also need to escrow, for example, the access credentials, the SAS resource scripts, data, subscriptions, and any other documentation to ensure complete SAS resilience if a release condition is met and the source code is given to the beneficiary. So 
and sum. Anything that would allow the client to run, update, maintain their software systems, and have continued access to a fully functioning SaaS tool should be deposited in escrow. So this is all well and good. We know that an escrow agreement guards against business interruption, that there are multiple arrangements that it can entertain, and it's applicable to SaaS as well as to more traditional on-premise software. But how do we know that what they deposit in the escrow is actually usable? Like what is to prevent them from uploading anything like their vacation pictures or some TikTok videos? How do we know what they're uploading is what they say they will? No, oh, it's, it's a good point, Lucy. So what we're asking here is what measures can a beneficiary take in order to make sure that what is being escrowed is indeed what they actually use and will need if their supplier fails and they want to avoid an interruption to their business? In other words, is there any level of, ins of assurance for deposits? And the short answer is yes. At Vaultinum, we offer three types of deposits, standard, element checked, and content checked. And when I say type of deposit, what I'm saying is this implies different levels of verification that provide greater or lesser assurances to the beneficiary that what is being deposited is in fact used. So the first type of deposit is the standard. This deposit, it does not go under any verification procedure by Vaultinum. This means that we do not verify that the source code being deposited is in fact the source code actually used by the user. In effect, with the standard deposit, we cannot know for certain what is deposited. The second form of deposit is the element checked deposit. So this form provides more assurance to the beneficiary and is also the most cost efficient. A Vaultinum agent will certify that the source code provided in the deposit is um, it, that it contains readable data, is presented in the form of a clear tree view, and is exploitable by the beneficiary. This level of verification provides a deposit verification report, which describes the elements deposited and attests to their verification. Lastly, we provide the content check deposit, which is the most in-depth verification possible. And depending on the level of assurance desired from high to highest is available in three diff different testing options. However, for all of them, it involves a Voltsum agent going on site to perform a functionality test to verify that the source code is operational and to guarantee that it co corresponds to that used by the beneficiary. This also is described and attested to in a deposit verification report. So while these three types of deposits have the same legal value, the technical verification of the element check and content checked provides a greater, greater level of assurance to the beneficiary that the deposited source code is that which they actually use and is up to date. And most importantly, for the content checked is operational. Thank you, Kristen. Can I just ask you now to talk to us a bit about some of the best practices that we could follow in order to have a successful escrow? Yes, I'm happy to. Um, well, to, just to build on what I was discussing, um, uh, if you're a beneficiary in the escrow scenario and you are already taking the steps to carefully negotiate and clearly define the release conditions, update frequency, and so on, why would you not take the final step and ensure that the source code deposited with Vaultinum is in fact the source code used? So by either selecting the element check or content check deposit. Also, we strongly suggest bringing up the escrow solution at the outset. So during the negotiations of a licensing or maintenance contract and not waiting for difficulties to start. <laughs> Next, and this would seem obvious, but it is important to make sure that all the accompanying technical documents are deposited along with the source code. So that if you are in the receiving end, you know how to use the stuff. <laughs> so in the case a release condition is met and the beneficiary receives the duplication of the source code and all of the other elements, it is up to the beneficiary user to know how to use the source code. And often this means having the how-to documentation. And for SAS escrow, this also means having at a minimum the information 
that would allow you to access the platform. Um, another best practice that I haven't touched too much on is the practice of updating regularly. No one wants to access obsolete elements. So we suggest, we suggest updating the source code continuously via Git, GitHub, if it's an option, or at least every time a new version is released and at a minimum once per year so that the beneficiary can be assured that it has the latest version at any given time. And this is especially important as it relates to the access clause, because as you remember, Vaultinum is not able to follow the contract and remind the supplier to make their updated deposits. Also, with the access clause, remember the best practice is to ensure that it is clear and unambiguous and includes the name of the work, the IDDN, the name of the escrow agent, and again, an unambiguous description of the release cases. And lastly, and this is a point I promised that I would return to earlier. So we, we know that the escrow agreements are in addition to any other agreement between the parties and concern only access to the source code upon certain conditions being met. So what the beneficiary, okay, the receiver of the source code can and cannot do with that source code once it is released to them is the subject of these other agreements, the licensing in user license or maintenance agreement, and it does not affect the supplier's rights in the software. So in effect, access to deposited source code does not transfer the intellectual property rights. It merely allows the beneficiary to use it in the manner under which it was contracted, licensed. So usage rights and the terms of these rights should be contemplated in case of access due to supplier failure. So in other words, what rights does the beneficiary have in the source code it obtains? Corrective maintenance, functionality, compatibility, further development. In the absence of a specific mention in the contract, whether it's the license or the escrow agreement, there will be no additional usage rights granted and no transfer of IP rights. So if you as a beneficiary do not have the right to maintain the software, for example, you want to consider including that right to do maintenance if a release condition is met. So these are some of the best practices we have, we have observed in our practice. And it brings me to the end of my presentation, which I hope was helpful and informative. Um, before I hand it to Lucy to take questions, which I think we lost her video. Don't know where she is, hopefully she'll come back. Um, I just want to briefly mention that Vaultinum's escrow solution covers all the various um, arrangements that we discussed today. So we provide contract templates for the tripartite, bipartite, and access clauses. Um, our solutions are entirely online, including a platform to conduct negotiations. And the solution encompasses all methods of software delivery, whether it is installed on client machines, SaaS, or cloud-based. And also we provide a multi-user user dashboard that allows the parties to easily track the evolution of the contract. We also here at Voltanum implement a strict and transparent verification procedure. If any of the condition releases are, release cases are met before allowing the beneficiary to access the escrowed source code. So I invite each of you to reach out to or visit our website if you would like any additional information. Um, now let's see if Lucy is there. Lucy, are you still with us? I am, Kristen. Can you still hear me? I can. We just can't see it. <laughs> that's, that's good enough for me. Um, thank you so much, Kristen. That's been really helpful, really insightful. I'm just going to go to our questions now. Um, so we have a question here saying, how does the access to the source code work? once the release conditions are met. Okay. So as I was saying at the, at the very end, so we have a secure and transparent access procedure, and this involves several layers of verification and security. So the full procedure is outlined uh, in our platform user agreement, and it is available online. Um, 
as a short introduction to how it works. So if a release condition is met, the beneficiary would notify Voltanum that it has been met and they would submit um, the escrow agreement, a valid license between them and the supplier um, and any evidence that the release condition has been met. So for example, if one of the access cases was the supplier enters bankruptcy, they would submit the decision of the court opening the procedure against them. And then an access commission, which is formed of three experts, one of which is the Voltanum senior legal advisor, um, who will then analyze all this information submitted and decide whether to grant access to, sor to the source code within the framework of the escrow agreement. So if a, favorable, if a favorable decision is reached, the source code and documentation is then duplicated and provided to the beneficiary. If, on the contrary, the Access Commission does not reach a favorable decision, the beneficiary would have to seek an independent judicial decision to enforce the contract. Is that answer? Yeah. <laughs> That's great, Kristen. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question here, which is more orientated around pricing. So okay. The question is, how much does a software escrow cost? And is this a one-time payment or a subscription to be paid monthly or annually? Sure. Um, so if you deposit your source code with Voltanum using one of our escrow arrangements, depending on which contract you choose, you will pay a yearly fee, usually um, on the signature date of the contract. When it comes to updates, we provide two options. First, each time you make an updated deposit, so you, you update the latest version of the source code, you also delete the previous version of the source code. And so this is at no extra cost, and it is included in the yearly escrow fee. The second option is that each time you make an updated deposit, you keep the previous version. And in this case, you pay a subscription um, for each new deposit for essentially the storage of it, and that's 48 euros a year. So let's say you have the initial deposit plus two updates. So you will pay two times 48, nothing for the initial deposit, two subscriptions for the two storage of updates. That's super helpful, thank you. Um, and we have one last question here from Marjorie, and it says, once the source code is uploaded with Voltanim, who has access to it and how do you ensure confidentiality? Oh, it's a great question, Marjorie. Um, so all the, so first let me just say that we've been in business, I think, you know, Lucy mentioned, you know, for 40 something years, this is, this is what we do. We, um, protect creators, innovators, investors, creations, you know, their intellectual property, their trade secrets, their know-how and source code. So this is our business. Um, and we obviously, you know, we, we take it very seriously. When we receive the, the source code, it is immediately encrypted and the encryption key is securely stored. No one can access the source code. Now, if the supplier asks for a duplicate of their deposit, they can do this whenever they want and we will provide it. But the beneficiary can only access it after one of the triggering events occurs and it goes through the access commission and a favorable decision is reached. Thank you, Kristen. Um, thank you, of course, for coming along today and speaking to us about all things software escrow. Um, I would just like to finish this session by thanking all the attendees for joining Voltanum today to discuss the benefits of a software escrow from both sides. We appreciate you signing in and we hope that you learned more about how Voltanum can assist you in your escrow process. Feel free to reach out to us via email um, if you'd like to know more and please be sure to follow us on LinkedIn to keep up to date with our upcoming webinars. So thank you very much. I hope you all have a great afternoon and hopefully we will see you next time. Thank you so much, Lucy. Thanks, everyone. Thank <laughs>